Welcome, everyone. My name is Manel Camps. I serve as faculty director for the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurial Development. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second talk in the series, My Journey, featuring Dan Adams. This talk is going to be hosted by Raj Kapani. Raj is a, a very successful entrepreneur and, all, and technology specialist in the area of fiber optics. He's also a great friend of UCSC. He serves a, a, as trustee. He also supports the SIG Foundation, the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurial Development that was actually founded by his father and that's still going strong. Um, and he's a great supporter of entrepreneurship. And he noticed that in most programs, there's a focus on the mechanics of how to build a company, right? So how you come up with a good idea? How do you then scale the company? How do you uh, look for clients? But there's a component that's missing and that's very important, which is the personal aspect. Entrepreneurship is very intuitive. So hearing about how other entrepreneurs went about their journeys is critically important. And this series is filling this need. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? How many of uh, the students here need a job after they graduate? Raise your hands. So I'm here to tell you that Neuralink is a fantastic place to work. And please consider that. This is not an ad. Uh, the specialties, the scientific background, the engineering, it's all very entrepreneurial. And I believe Dan will talk a little bit more about this later in his talk. But I wanted to give you guys, first of all, a understanding of who you're meeting today a person that's done a lot, Dr. Daniel Adams, a person that has been in the academia field for some time and has now transitioned over to uh, a professional startup and, uh, and working at creating beautiful technologies. Let me give you some background to Daniel Adams. Got his Bachelor of Science, Neuroscience, University College of London. Got his PhD in Visual Neuroscience, University College of London. In Japan, postdoc scholar, Nihon University, School of Medicine, Visual Neuroscience. Sorry if this is going a while, but this is who you're talking to today. Uh, UCSF postdoc fellow, Visual Neuroscience. Professor, UCSF, ophthalmology. University of Trento, Italy, professor, Center of Mind and Brain Science. Well, you've done a lot. <laughs> and Neuralink, principal investigator, scientific officer of the company. And I'm going to go on a little bit further. He has memberships at Society of Neuroscience, Cognitive Neuroscience, American Association of Science Advancement. Uh, he's done corporate talks and participated with Welcome Dolby. Apple, Meta, Stanford University. He's been a master's thesis supervisor for more than 15 students. And he's reviewed publications, books, and chapters, I think almost close to 50. So welcome Dr. Daniel Adams, please, to the stage. Thank you very much, Raj, for that very, very generous uh, introduction. Okay. So, Dan, from my perspective, one of the things I think we're all interested in is from your youth, which could be high school, college, how did you know neuroscience was going to be your career? Well, I, I didn't for uh, quite a long time. So I grew up in a, in a tiny village in the Cambridgeshire countryside in England. And um, my father was a mechanical engineer and my mother was a biologist. So she's, she's actually a biology teacher, a high school teacher of biology. And so I had an engineering 
side from my father and biology from my mother. And I, I grew up a little bit more interested in biology than, than mechanical engineering. And so I, I originally wanted to study biochemistry. But uh, things didn't go quite as planned during uh, some exams in the UK called the A-levels. And I had, had to end up taking a year off and retake my chemistry A-level because I got an E. And that wasn't enough to get to university. And during that year, I started work at a psychiatric hospital. It was a local hospital to, to where I grew up. And this is a hospital for, it was a private hospital, but it was paid for, the patients were paid for by the NHS. So these were people who the NHS couldn't handle because they were too violent, too disturbed, or too disruptive. And at the tender age of 18, I was thrown in among uh, adults with schizophrenia, psychosis, and uh, paranoia and delusions. Basically, to live with them during the day, but also to, uh, when they got unmanageable, to physically, literally hold them down. And this was, I think, one of the really decisive parts of, of my, my interest. I mean, what I, what I came to realize, just talking to people, to psychiatric patients, um, severely uh, mentally ill people uh, every day, uh, was just how important brain health is, how much of our everyday world obviously is, is in, our, in our heads, and how something, how, when something simple, presumably simple, or maybe quite complex goes wrong uh, in the brain, it can change a person's personality, their outlook on life, uh, the way they're accepted in society, and absolutely everything about that person can change. And so that really brought it home to me just how important this sort of piece of meat that we have inside our skull is, and inspired me to, to not study biochemistry, but to, uh, to study neuroscience. And really, by, by good fortune at that time, there was a, a, a sort of boon. This is 1990. And there was a boon in, in, in studying neuroscience at that time. And at University College London, I was actually one of the first people, or in the first year, that neuroscience was offered as a, as a degree um, individually. So there were seven of us in that very first year of neuroscience at UCL. And, um, and I was one of those seven people. So, uh, and I, I was never disappointed by studying neuroscience. Um, every field, every, I never went on to study mental illness, but um, uh, every part of neuroscience for me at, at that time was, was absolutely fascinating. Good. Good. You know, in your introduction, it looks like you've had a tremendous amount of experience in the academics and the sciences. And then later in your career, you transitioned over to the product and technology side. Tell us a little bit about how that transition occurred. So in academia, <clears throat> academia is, is interesting because uh, it, it's a mix, obviously, of, of engineering, of technical skills, and also of very high aspirations about understanding things like consciousness and perception. And my personal route through academia was always focused on the sort of hands-on experimental technical part. So although, of course, everyone wants to understand if there's a seat of consciousness in the brain and where it might lie and how visual perception works, for example, these were very important things to me. But what drove me on a day-to-day -day basis was working in a lab with my hands, solving technical problems, buying equipment, putting it together, doing histology, doing surgeries, doing um, uh, you know, designing equipment for, for testing animals and, uh, and doing electrophysiological recordings. And so after, I guess, 25 years of, of enjoying that process and, and being successful in terms of, of the, the currency of academia, which is basically getting grants and publishing papers, um, I found myself getting further and further away from, from that hands-on, uh, practical, problem-solving situation. And I, at a certain point, decided to make, to make a big change um, and to get into a, a, an area where I would be able to be more focused on the, not on the sort of uh, esoteric uh, uh, ideas of academia, but more on the, the craft of science rather than the actual practice of it. And so at, at that time, again, fortunately, Neuralink was, um, this was in, about four and a half years ago, so Neuralink was just coming out of stealth. They had this, I don't know if anyone's seen this, but there's a video of, of the first presentations of, of some of the early Neuralink work at the 
Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. So I saw that, and also a former colleague of mine is, is one of the founders, uh, a guy called uh, Flip Sabies, who's since left the company. At that point, I realized, well, it's possible to get out of academia. Um, for a long time, I'd thought I, I was basically a, a very highly trained monkey neurophysiologist and an anatomist. And there aren't too many jobs in an industry for monkey neurophysiologists, except Neuralink. When it came up, they, they were working on monkeys. They were uh, doing electrophysiology. And um, so I thought, well, this is my first opportunity to actually get out of academia. With hindsight, I probably could have, I probably could have transferred out of academia sooner. But um, I think it's typical that, that people uh, don't always consider the opportunities outside their their day to day, and um, at a certain point, I, I just put in an application to, to Neuralink, and um, I remember Flip called me and said, "Are you are you serious?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, I, I'm I'm done with academia. I, I'm I wouldn't say I was bored with it, but I'm I'm not getting as much reward from it anymore." And so uh, and so that was that was the, that was the transition. And to be honest, um, my only regret is that I didn't do it sooner. Uh, I think that's not to say anything against academia. Academia is, is essential, and scientific research is, is essential and has made everything we do at Neuralink possible. But it's very different to, to what we're doing at Neuralink. We're not doing science at Neuralink. This is, we're an engineering company developing a medical device. And, um, and so, you know, I mentioned the currency of academia is getting grants and getting papers. The currency in, in industry is, does your device work? And you don't need reviewer number two to tell you that. You don't need uh, you know, to write begging letters to the NIH uh, to get money. Well, luckily, we don't have to do that. But um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if, you're, if your experiment or your device works and produces, does what it's supposed to do, then you go with that. And then that's, that's you know, uh, a very straightforward and, and, and simple kind of way of, of judging um, a career instead of how many papers have you had? How many students have you had? Uh, how many um, citations do you have? So. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, the, the one thing I think we're all curious about is specifically if you look at your day-to-day -day at Neuralink, what, with your background in neuroscience and visual systems, can you help us understand a little bit about how a visual system works and how you're overlaying the neural link technology to match that. Right. So the, the primary application of, of the Neuralink brain implant, um, I'm guessing many of you have, have heard of a, a subject that we, a participant in, a, in an FDA trial that we, that we uh, is the first participant, first recipient of the Neuralink. Um, so the application there is for someone who has tetraplegia, completely paralyzed from the neck down, and the Neuralink records information from the motor cortex of the brain, the part of the, of the brain that controls their, or would have formerly controlled their hand if they didn't have a spinal cord injury. And instead of that information traveling down the spinal cord to control the muscles of the hand, it's recorded by the device and then decoded by an algorithm that converts it into an, basically an X, Y coordinate system for controlling a mouse on a computer. So X, Y, and click, and maybe left click and right click and scroll button, but basically, it's essentially a Bluetooth mouse inside your head. So a person with a Neuralink can walk up to a computer and uh, pair of, with it just like you would pair a Bluetooth mouse and then control it um, just by thinking about moving their hand. And you can see there's, we recently uh, released some video of, of, the, of a participant playing chess and playing Civilization, and really enjoying this newfound freedom, freedom that, that, that is allowed by the Neuralink. That's the first application. And the reason we chose that application is because it really only involves recording signals from the brain. And it's one of the only applications that really only needs to record uh, and doesn't need to stimulate. So for other applications, uh, particularly the one that I'm working on, which is a, a visual prosthesis, we need to actually input information into the brain. So the idea of the, the visual prosthesis is that instead of putting electrodes into the motor cortex, they go into uh, the visual cortex, which is at the back of the brain, and the visual cortex contains a map of, of what you see. It's retinotopically, retinotopically organized. So neighboring points in space fall onto neighboring points in your retina, and they're represented as neighboring points 
on your visual cortex. So your visual cortex is about the size of a credit card and it contains half of your visual field laid out just like a screen inside your brain. And the information in that screen is encoded in the activity of neurons. So in someone who's blind, all that machinery is still there. The only problem is that it's, not, it's no longer getting an input from the eye. So someone with a degenerative retinal disease or an eye injury or an injury to, to the optic nerve is blind because obviously everything in front of the optic nerve uh, doesn't work. But visual cortex still works. So you can put electrodes into it and pass, instead of recording, you can record as well, but instead of recording, you can actually stimulate pass current into the brain to produce activity within, within the visual cortex. And that results in visual perception. And for every electrode that you plug into the visual cortex, you can stimulate to produce a single sort of spot in the visual field. And because the visual cortex is, is organized retinotopically, these spots occur in different locations across the visual field. So the application for the Neuralink Envision is to obviously drill a hole, not here, but here, uh, insert the electrodes into the visual cortex, and instead of recording, stimulate, and that the pattern of stimulation is then controlled with a video camera. And probably the first, the first thing that we, we would do would for, would, for example, say, take the, take the video camera on your iPhone and transmit the signal over Bluetooth to the device and change uh, and control the pattern of stimulation on the device from the camera on your iPhone. So if you were blind, you would basically be able to hold your eye, uh, which would be the video camera, look around, look behind you, uh, and, and receive information from, from, that, from that video camera. Um, that's not to say that we're expecting to be able to reproduce the incredibly uh, deep and, and complex uh, and vivid image that all of us have in front of our eyes all the time. We're basically working with spots of light rather than you know, the incredibly, uh, uh, to me, we, is, is a visual neuroscientist is, is constantly amazing picture that we all have in front of our face. But what we will do is to be able to, by increasing the number of spots that we can see, these are called phosphines, and the, and the density, we'll be able to basically exploit the visual cortex as a sensory surface that we can use to input uh, useful information to a blind person. So this would include information required to navigate uh, their environment, to see objects, to recognize things. Yeah. So, so if somebody that's blind is using the elements you just mentioned, what are they actually seeing? Is it like a dot printer type of look, or is it a Mario Brothers kind of look? Yeah. What, it's, what yeah. do they see? It's not real color, right? It's, well, it's, there's, there's, it's complicated. And I also want to make it clear that people have been stimulating visual cortex since the 1960s uh, to produce spots of light called phosphines. And all we're doing is basically increasing the number and increasing the field of view. And what people see are, it's something like a dot matrix printer, except that the, the spots of light aren't going to be regularly organized. Their location really just depends on exactly where the electrodes go. And, and we're, we're basically pushing the electrodes in almost blindly through the cortex. And uh, so you'll see a number of spots. Um, if we just wired up those spots to, say, brightness from a video camera, you'd produce a very confusing uh, image. So a lot of how this is going to work in humans is to do with the, the image analysis steps. So that the camera, uh, the image from the camera will be analyzed and, and important features will be extracted and only electrodes that convey those important parts of the image will be stimulated. So we'll, we'll basically be able to produce a very rarefied uh, uh, image in, in terms of little spots of light, but that image will actually be a useful image. And so we, you won't have to extract all the useful information from, from, from that image, which is what, what we do to normal vision all the time. And so we, yeah. So now I'm going to ask you to get up, if you wouldn't mind, mm. and share a slide sure. of the N1 chip. So uh, let me just start with a kind of overview of of what, what Neuralink is, we, we use, we basically, we're trying to be vertically inter, uh, integrated. So we try and do everything ourselves. That includes designing ASICs or specialized uh, chips that are on the device itself. We make 
our own electrodes. These are made by uh, thin film deposition onto silicon wafers. We do all that in-house as well. And then because these electrodes are incredibly fine and thin, they have to be inserted by a surgical robot. So we have also developed and built a, a surgical robot. So the, the, the device itself Slide. There we are. This is basically the, the device itself. I think, yeah, I even brought one here. So this is, the, uh, this is a Neuralink device. And um, I'll leave it here if anyone wants to come and look at it. But basically, it's, uh, it's a tiny circuit board um, with a number of amplifiers and some electronics on these ASICs. And, and it's connected to uh, the electrodes, which electrodes on this one have been torn off because they're, they're very fragile and thin. But the electrodes come out of the base. And so essentially what we do in the surgery is drill a hole in, in the skull that's the same size as this round part of the, of the um, device. And then we, the robot inserts all of the electrodes into the cortex. And then the device itself plugs the hole. And then the whole thing is completely covered with the scalp. So there's no trans, you know, percutaneous connectors or wires or anything. That, and the device communicates in, in completely with uh, Bluetooth. But really, the, the, the breakthrough in this device is that the threads are so fine and so flexible that they move with the brain. So people are aware that if you, if you move your head around, your brain is like a jelly in sort of floating inside liquid inside your skull. And it, it moves quite substantially when you, when you move your head. And so many previous approaches had used stiff wire electrodes. So we have developed these very fine electrodes that can move with the brain. And so they, they don't damage the brain and they don't get surrounded by scar tissue and, uh, um, and things that can uh, prevent the signal. So just to give you an idea of, of these threads, this is just some threads that have been explanted. You can see each thread actually has 16 electrodes on. You can see those little tabs flowing past. Those are the electrodes. And uh, the trace, a trace for each, for each electrode. And at the very tip of the thread, there's a little loop, and that's the loop that the robot needle picks up and transports the thread over to insert it into the brain. From this image, you really can't get an idea about how small these are. So um, I made a fun movie. Uh, here you can see a, a normal ant that I just found on the sidewalk. And here are the, the loops. You can just see the, the row of loops uh, on each of the threads. And then you see, see the loop on the end. And that little black spot is the first electrode of 16 on each, on each one. So it's the robot needle goes through the little hole in the end, peels off the thread, and it's, it inserts into the brain. How do, how do you get this technology to move a prosthetic? I mean, I'm, ju I'm just thinking yeah. out loud here, because you, you've talked about some of the applications, but some of them to be able to you know, take somebody that's disadvantaged and move the prosthetics around is so important. So once you've, once you've decoded the signals to produce a mouse movement on the screen, converting that into a three-dimensional trajectory to control a, a robot arm, for example, uh, is reasonably trivial. And, and it's, it's all it's technology. It's, it's not science at that stage. And um, one of the projects that, that, we're, that we're working at uh, now is actually to, um, we're collaborating with the Tesla uh, Optimus robot, so that we'll be able to control, basically take the arm or maybe even the entire Optimus robot and control it uh, with uh, the output from the device. So um, as the person thinks about moving, then it's just a matter of decoding the neural activity that's, that's associated with those intended movements and converting it into signals that can control the servos and motors in, in the prosthetic limb. So conceptually, overcoming blindness is a, is a potential path. Prosthetics, potential path for mm -hmm. this. Mental illness, potential path. Depression, these are all things depending on where you move the chip, the N1 chip, into different parts of the brain. You could solve these problems down the road. Yes. And with enough funding, of course. <laughs> There's, so we're, we're, we're concentrating on the low hanging fruit first. Um, and things that have also been done before. So again, we're not claiming to, have, to be the first people to do any of this, 
Uh, there's been a very uh, successful field of brain computer interface research um, going back 20 years where, where people have been able to, uh, in humans, uh, control cursors exactly as we are um, with fewer electrodes and with, with also with percutaneous connectors. But what we're really connect, concentrating on is taking this technology out of the lab and making it, into some, make it into something that people can use at home without having racks of computers and a team of postdocs around them all the time. And so um, other applications are vision, as we've mentioned. Um, there's also a, a possibility to in, in epilepsy. So people with focal epileptic uh, 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 epilepsy have a little dysplasia often in the cortex that, that can even be seen just under normal MRI sometimes. And so the idea here would be that we insert the electrodes into that area. And at the very least, we provide an early warning system for that person. So it's a Bluetooth device. You can easily imagine your Apple Watch gives an alert when the device detects epileptiform activity and says, you better sit down or lie down. You're going to have a, a seizure. Or it automatically calls someone, a loved one, to tell them and let them know what's happening. Um, this is an application very close to my heart because my 22-year-old my, uh, daughter uh, it, is exactly that subject. Uh, she has a little dysplasia in, in her left uh, uh, cortex. And you know uh, that would have helped her a number of times. Um, uh, just that, even just a few seconds of warning would have, would, could have been um, extremely useful. But beyond that, the idea would be to actually do something about that activity. So we, have a, we, have, we could have thousands of electrodes in that area. And as well as recording activity, we could stimulate. And if there are, and there are obviously scientific research on this project, but if we could stimulate regions of the cortex surrounding that area or perhaps in other parts of the brain to try and prevent that elept, elept, you know, electroform activity becoming a seizure, that would be life-changing for, for many people. Um, other applications are, there's a, a, there's a big problem for many people called tinnitus. And one thing I've noticed, I never knew that much about it, but one thing I've noticed is whenever we tweet something or put something on the internet about about something that we're doing in Neuralink, there's always a bunch of comments saying, when are you going to be able to cure tinnitus? Um, tinnitus is an incredibly uh, uh, debilitating disease for, for many people. There are even people who have committed suicide because they have intractable tinnitus. So another application would be, and so the idea of tinnitus is that you have basically overactivity of, of your auditory system, and it often occurs within a, a frequency range that is basically the resonant frequency of, of your cochlea. So when, you're, when, you, when you hear broadband noise, um, there's a resonant frequency, it's about 22 kilohertz, I think, that, that wipes out a region of your cochlea so that you don't, your brain doesn't get any input from that frequency. And the brain is expecting, I'm anthropomorphizing about the brain here, like a real neuroscientist, but um, the brain thinks, well, you know, where's this activity gone? I'm, it must be super quiet, so I'll just turn up the gain. And so the brain keeps turning up the gain, expecting to receive a signal in this frequency range, but it never occurs. In turning up the gain, it basically produces a feedback system that produces this high, high pitch whining for, for many people. If we could, this again is, the, the way to do this would be to initially to develop a device that would stimulate that auditory cortex. Again, auditory cortex is kind of tonotopic, so there's a region that, that is specialized for that particular frequency. If we could stimulate it, the brain would think, oh, okay, here's the input, I can turn the gain down. But beyond that, perhaps this would also be a way to restore hearing to people who are deaf. And obviously, there's current technology for that is the cochlear implant. But the cochlear implant is basically a way to understand language. It doesn't restore hearing in the way that we experience hearing. Perhaps by in, uh, being able to insert thousands of electrodes into auditory cortex and stimulating them uh, according to the output from the microphone, we might be able to restore more natural sounding hearing to, to deaf people. That's uh, another application. Yeah. So when you look at all these applications, you, you, you think there's going to need to be a tremendous amount of engineering inside Neuralink to cope with next great things that you're, you're telling us about. Yeah. Can you give us an idea without telling us anything proprietary, just give us an idea of what kind of people you have inside the company working with you and a little bit about the culture of the startup, which 
So I, I don't have that much experience with startups. Neuralink was the first job I took outside of academia, and I'm not sure, I suspect that much of what happens at Neuralink is not typical for a startup. Um, but one thing that I think is, is exciting for me uh, and that I didn't really expect is that there's a huge amount of autonomy at Neuralink. So the, the, there's this idea that the, the ideal employee is someone who walks in the door, looks around, can see what needs to happen, sees what needs to be done, and then goes ahead and does it. Uh, sometimes we get people like that who are just phenomenal. They walk in, they hardly, hardly need any supervision. No one has time to manage someone or, or micromanage anyone. And, and sometimes people walk in and they look around and they kind of look lost and say, well, you know, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. No one's told me what I'm supposed to be doing. And to them, uh, it's like, well, we're, we're making a brain computer interface here. Uh, so, um, uh, so if you're the kind of person who can, who can just basically see something and then actually do it rather than coming up with reasons why it can't be done, then, then you're incredibly valuable. So there's a, there's a the great many people like that. There used to be, that culture has changed a little bit as the company's expanded. When I joined, we were 50 people. We were based in, in the Mission District in San Francisco. Uh, we shared an office building with OpenAI, interestingly. We had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> and um, they didn't know what we were doing either. Um, that, as the company's expanded, obviously roles have become more specialized. And the role of a generalist, which was, which was really my, my, my kind of role when I joined, has, has become uh, less important. But, but 90% or maybe even 99% of people at Neuralink are engineers. Uh, we, we can count the number of neuroscientists, like myself, on, on really, well, just one, just over one hand. <laughs> so, um, uh, but, and those engineers are, are, are every, every aspect of engineering, from thin film um, uh, lithography through ASIC design, uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, robotics engineers, a lot of software development, um, and a lot of people who just are very good at everything. Um, so that, that's, that's the sort of, and very few, turns out neuroscientists publish everything they do, and so you don't really need them. You can just read their papers. Uh, they're good for the lunchtime conversation. I think that's probably my major role at, at Neuralink, uh, is talking about the brain. But, um, but yeah, so you don't need to be a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon or, or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Now, everybody knows about Elon Musk being one of the founders of this, this company. Tell us what it's like to work with him a little bit. And uh, I know you've, you've had interaction with him. What's that like? And you're still alive, so I'm assuming <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> I personally have never failed to be impressed by, by Elon. Um, I'm not quite sure how he does it, but he comes into a meeting. Actually, this is a little less true since, he, since the whole Twitter thing. But w at the beginning of the company, he, we would have weekly meetings, and he would just know exactly what everyone was doing. And uh, he would get up to date incredibly quickly and actually have useful and important suggestions about things to do. And he has, you know, I like to describe him as, as the world's biggest bullshit detector. He can come in, uh, look at projects, hear about something that you're doing, and instantly know whether it's necessary, whether it's important, and, uh, and how much effort should be expended on that particular project. Um, scientists need to be herded a little bit, like cats, I guess. Not a very good analogy, but they need to be look, they need to be guided because the, the instinct of a scientist and also of many engineers is to find a rabbit hole and then dive down it and dig and dig and dig. And because they know at the bottom of that rabbit hole, there might be a little piece of knowledge that, that hasn't been learned by the world yet. And that's a, that's a good property of a, of, of, a, of a scientist, but a very bad property of someone who's trying to actually get something developed and built, like a real device built that works. Because um, obviously you can go down those rabbit holes as much as you want and you make very little progress. The, the, the important thing is to know when to stop digging and when to move on. 
And so uh, for me, going into industry, uh, this is great because, no, I'm, I'm not very patient. And um, personally, you know, if, if I see something's not working or is, 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 is not very relevant, I, I'm inclined to give up on it. But of course, in science, you don't do that. You keep digging, even if it comes out as a negative experiment. It's your responsibility as a scientist to uncover this natural truth that, that is, is, is hidden from you. But if you, if, if you, in industry, if you do that, uh, you're going to be dead. And so, uh, the input from Elon, uh, is, you know, he has, he has a bunch of sayings, which everyone is very familiar with. The most, I think the most important one is the best part is no part. So, and his biggest uh, gripe about engineers is that they spend 90% of their time engineering devices that should not exist. So the best way to solve a problem is to delete the part. And if it so happens that you need to put that, that everything goes wrong and you have to put that part back, uh, then that's a good thing. Uh, it means that the part was actually really valuable. And so we should be putting things back like 10% of the time that we delete them. And so, uh, and, and having that, it's very easy as a, as a working, you know, levels down deeply in, in a particular subject. It's very easy to lose sight of what is really necessary and, and uh, what is just satisfying uh, uh, your curiosity as a scientist or as an engineer. How is the FDA re regulatory agency uh, involved? with you in, in this industry? What part do they play? And how do you get through them to do what you need to do? So, yeah, obviously every medical device needs to be approved by the FDA. And uh, our device is known as a class three medical device, which is a device that is, is, um, uh, is implanted and, and uh, uh, you know, invasive. Um, so to get that authorization, we have to go through a number of steps with the FDA. The first step was to have authorization for um, uh, investigative, experimental investigative exemption, uh, IDE. So ID, anyway. um, and this basically allows us to test our device for safety in, in humans. And to do that, we have to provide a huge amount of evidence that the device is going to be safe. And, um, and we're, we're in that stage at the moment. So our device is not FDA approved for, for use, but we do have permission or an exemption to be able to implant it into humans and to study them and to, uh, to see what kind of benefit we can provide. This is mostly a safety testing uh, stage and there's no guarantee to those subjects that they're going to get any benefit from the device whatsoever. Um, obviously, we want them to have a benefit from the device. Uh, and, and so far that looks like uh, that we are able to provide some benefit to the subjects. How long does it take to get through the FDA? So we, we approached the FDA, uh, I think two years ago, and went through an initial um, uh, communication with them. And, you know, the FDA are very strict, and we were a company coming up with something that had never been done before, using a robot to insert these electrodes into the brain. And so it took us a long time to get their trust and um, for them to trust us. And so uh, we've been working with them for, I think, about two years so far. And I can't predict how long it's going to take to get to the next stage of development uh, of the device. But the, the next stage will be a set of, set of tests, again, in humans that show that the device is not only safe, but is also effective. And um, uh, by the end of that point, we can begin uh, to get market approval, so for, for the device, and I, I can't predict how long that would that would be, but we're hoping, obviously, as soon as as soon as possible. So we've talked a little bit about Neuralink. How about the competition out there? Is it stiff? Can you tell us publicly what they're doing different than what you're doing, and how you're better? <laughs> so there are a number of. Neurotech companies, um, they've, some of them have taken a different route to us. And uh, it's not necessarily an inferior route, but uh, in some ways, it's led to easier approval from the FDA. So one company um, have developed a device that is inserted through the veins. 
And it's called a stent road, which is basically a stent electrode that goes up into the superior sagittal sinus, which is a big um, uh, blood-containing uh, sinus in between the two hemispheres. And it goes in there and expands slightly and is able to, to record remotely record neural activity from the motor cortex. And they've, because putting stents into the vasculature is something that is basically already proved and used uh, in medicine, um, they've, they've had a much shorter path to getting FDA approval because they're basically piggybacking on to something that's already approved. And they've had success with, with developing a, uh, um, a brain-computer interface with this device. The limitations of it are that it has many fewer electrodes. Uh, our device at the moment has 1,024. I'm not actually sure how many are on this dentrode, but it's in the order of less than 100. And so, and also those electrodes are receiving information that is much more remote from, uh, uh, you know, they're not recording the individual activity of neurons, they're recording basically a, a mass activity of all the neurons called the LFP. And so what they, they've been able to do is use uh, basically a, a click signal so they can have people, instead of having like XY control of a mouse, they can, they can determine whether the person clicks or not. Um, for us, uh, that's not enough, and, and we think that we, a more invasive approach is, is in the long run going to be more helpful. Um, and there are other companies developing different kinds of electrodes. Um, again, most of them are less invasive than our approach. So our, our ideas are that to get that we're interested in getting the, the highest resolution signal from the brain, um, and we can overcome the invasiveness by by uh, making the technology to insert those bright electrodes uh, very sophisticated and using very fine and um, flexible electrodes. So we're probably the most invasive uh, company, but we stand we have the most potential to. Uh, to recover the highest fidelity signals and also to have a greater number of applications than, than, other, than other companies. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> you know, um, a lot of us have experienced watching a startup, but participating is a whole diff different ballgame. And I've been in a few myself and I know how stressful, so I'm going to take it down a little bit to mm -hmm. you. When you look at the kind of pressure and stress that goes on in a startup, how do you, being a father of two wonderful girls, how do you balance yourself through that? What kinds of things do you do outside the company to remain sane without needing a chip? Mm. Um, I think I'm in kind of a privileged position. Uh, my life has taken a uh, a path that is actually quite uh, beneficial in terms of this stage in my career. So I have two wonderful daughters uh, who uh, are both at college, um, one at UC Berkeley studying mechanical engineering. I'm very proud of her. And the other one on the East Coast. Um, so they're both left home. Um, I, I divorced my wife and I'm living alone, quite close to work, and I'm able to immerse myself in my work as much as I want to. Um, there obviously is some pressure to get things done at Neuralink. Uh, we like to move fast and um, we like to create short deadlines and, and inspire people to work. But everyone at Neuralink is, is, is doing their life's work. They are completely invested and excited and, uh, and feel privileged to be able to work in that environment. There is stress, um, but uh, I think personally, I, I maybe I'm kind of immune to stress. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not, but no, I, 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 I go cycling. I, I, I try and enjoy my, my daughters when they're home. And, and, uh, uh, but th for me, this is a new phase in my career. Um, basically, my career has sort of reached a plateau in academia. And now it's just uh, accelerating again in this, in this new endeavor. Super exciting. Let's give Dan a round of applause, please. I mean, he's been a very good deal. Uh, 
We'd like to open it up to questions from you, Nada. Um, I was just wondering, I know you are more on the neuroscience side of things, but do you have any familiarity with like what machine learning and AI things are being used currently and what you're doing or just Neuralink in general? So we do use some machine learning algorithms in decoding the signal from motor cortex. We're planning to, so one of the problems, but, but these, are very, these are very sort of primitive machine learning applications. Uh, there's not really uh, an application for AI in the company, um, aside from people using it to write code. Myself, who have never learned how to, how to write code, suddenly I'm, oh, wait a minute, I can just ask chat GPT. And it writes code for me, which is phenomenal. Um, there's an application for machine learning uh, in, in my, my part of the implant. Uh, one, one of the problems with the visual implant is that you put all these electrodes into someone who's blind and you stimulate them, but you don't know where those phosphines are in their visual field. So the way that this has been done until now is to have the blind person basically point to where all these points are, but we, which is fine if you only got 64 or 100 electrodes, but we're planning to put 6,000 in, in our first patient. So uh, obviously you don't want to go through each of those individually, so there'll be applications for producing patterns that the person identifies as figures or letters, and then some sort of machine learning way to basically calibrate the visual system for those, for those subjects. Uh, that could be one potential application. Um, but in general, you know, one of the premises of, of Neuralink, uh, one of the sort of founding principles was that it will allow us to communicate with or become symbiotic with artificial intelligence. Um, so far, we're not doing that. Um, and I, if you ask me, I think that's, that's quite a ways off, uh, by which I mean a few hundred years. <laughs> but, you know, I've been wrong before. Uh, so we'll see. Um, but no, there's not, there's not a huge emphasis on artificial intelligence. You know, what we're doing at the moment is, is, is fairly mechanistic. Uh, we're, we have a very simple, very fast algorithm. Has to, everything has to work super, super low latency for decoding signals from the brain if you want to have any control over a cursor. And so this is a, this is a very straightforward, simple algorithm that, that uh, decodes signals. Um, so, you know, we do have machine, machine learning specialists, um, but it's not a huge focus of the company. Um, hi. So I know you mentioned that 90% of the company is engineers. Um, if someone doesn't have a formal background in any of the biology stuff, uh, what would you recommend that they uh, look into or learn to contribute to technology like this? So there are, there are specialized roles. Um, so yeah, Raj mentioned that we're hiring, we're hiring as fast, we're hiring good people as fast as we can, which doesn't mean that we're hiring fast. Uh, so the kinds of roles we're looking for are people who have a proven track record of actually getting things done, um, solving problems and, and producing things that work uh, from beginning to end. Uh, we're not looking for um, uh, ideas people. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have ideas, but it means that you need to have more than ideas. You need to actually have those ideas, produce them, and, and, and get, them, get them working from start to finish. There's, there's, a, there's a sort of argument at, at, at Neuralink about people with PhDs. So obviously everyone thinks if you have a PhD, then you're, you must be qualified to do something. We don't necessarily feel that's true. The one thing about a PhD, the good thing about a PhD is not that you have a PhD, is that you've been in an environment, laboratory environment, where you have technology and scientific toys and modes of analysis and everything at your disposal and you can use all those things to produce, to, to get something to work, which is basically your PhD thesis, to do research. And that, that, is, a, that is a good thing, uh, that's a good track record for an employee because it means that, that, that they can you know, literally do things. They're not, they're not you know, if it was a philosophy PhD, maybe it would be different, but um, for the most part in the biological sciences and engineering, um, the, the environment that you're in to do a PhD is, is, is a very good training environment to, to get a job at Neuralink, for example. But that doesn't mean that you have to have a PhD to, to work there. It just means that you've been in that environment that has generated the kinds of skills that you need. Um, but, you know, there are, there are, there are jobs 
for basically almost every field of engineering uh, at Neuralink, from electrochemistry through, you know, as I said, ASIC design, thin layer, mechanical, robotics. And so that as a background, and then on top of that, some evidence that you're actually going to be a useful person uh, and not wander around saying that you, you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I had a question at the start of the talk. Uh, it was your extensive like experience in academia was mentioned, and I was kind of wondering what the consistent factor of motivation was for you from jumping from the PhD to a postdoc to multiple other yeah. positions. So, what kind of kept you going so that you could get to the point you are? So, to begin with, I was basically following a path of least resistance. Um, I went to university because I needed something to study and I was interested in the brain and neuroscience popped up and that was very fortunate and I studied neuroscience and found myself, one of my, my lecturers uh, during my neuroscience uh, degree is a professor, uh, a guy called uh, Professor Semiozeki, who is one of the real, one of the, the seminal uh, discoverers of uh, the way that information is processed in, in the visual cortex. Um, and so after his lecture, I went up and said, hey, I'm really interested in, in visual processing. And he said, oh, well, why don't you come to my lab to do a PhD? Okay. Uh, so that happened. And, uh, and he was also at UCL. UCL. And so I survived uh, four years uh, with him and um, ended up with a PhD, at which point, well, what comes next? A uh, postdoc. So I looked around and I saw an advert for a postdoc at San Francisco. UCSF, and I was like, well, I've never been to the States before. It'd be nice to spend three years uh, doing a postdoc at, uh, in San Francisco. And so I turned up at SFO with a suitcase, having never even spoken to my, to my postdoc supervisor. We just did everything on email. I sent him a copy of my PhD thesis, and he said, okay, come over and see how it goes. So I spent, but well, what I didn't realize is that uh, the lab that I was supposed to be doing the research in for that, uh, for that project at, in ophthalmology at UCSF, I was working with a guy called Jonathan Porson in ophthalmology. The lab hadn't actually been built. So one of the first uh, jobs I had was to talk to architects about designing a, 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 a monkey vivarium for, for doing uh, uh, recordings in, in awake behaving monkeys, uh, recording from the visual system. So we got the lab built, and then he said, well, you can't be a postdoc anymore. Now you have to be a staff scientist. So I was like, OK, whatever. And then a few years later, it was like, well, now we can't, you, you can't be a staff scientist anymore, so we have to put you on the faculty. So he got an adjunct professorship there. But all the time, I was really just following what I was interested in, doing what I loved, which was working in a lab, doing surgeries, doing histology, cutting brains, doing electrophysiological recording, building eye trackers. Uh, and it was a very small lab, so I, I could do all of those things. And, and eventually, the lab was built. We did the experiments um, and a whole bunch more. And it was, you know, I was 25 years into a three-year postdoc. And uh, along the way, I got married and had kids. And, and at that point, was like, well, now I'm ready for something new. And, and that, was the, that was the inspiration to say, OK, I've worked with Jonathan for long enough. And, uh, and then to, to go into industry. And my first, actually, my first industry application was to Apple. So Apple advertised a few, it must be five years ago, they advertised for a neuroscientist. I was like, well, I'm a neuroscientist. I want to work at Apple. Uh, and after like six months of backwards and forwards, it turned out that they weren't really looking for a neuroscientist. Um, they were looking for someone who could write code. And, uh, and so that wasn't me. But, um, but at that point, I was like, Neuro Neuralink popped up, so I just turned around the application and said, okay, well, I'll go for that. So I have a question about the um, kind of, so you were trained as a traditional neuroscientist, is that correct? Yes. And so when you kind of ended up at Neuralink, I understand Neuralink uses the dynamical systems approach to uh, processing and uh, extracting signals from the brain. How did you find your transition from like classical neuroscience, your EFUs recording, spike sorting and whatnot, mm -hmm. onto using that dynamical systems approach? I'm not sure what you mean by dynamic systems approach. I'm talking about the, uh, the methods pioneered by Krishna Shinoy. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my background, and the reason I don't know what that means, is because my background was not in that area of neuroscience. Uh, so I, was, I had been studying binocular vision and stereopsis and how that goes wrong in 
people with uh, strabismus, who, you know, kids who grow up with misaligned eyes. And I had heard Krishna speak, and, and we also collaborated with, with him in the early days uh, since his tragic passing away. Um, but I, I had very little background in that area. But it turns out that the basic principles are very similar. So, as you mentioned, things like spike sorting, uh, you know, we're able to stream full uh, resolution um, images from electrodes as well as, uh, as, well as sort of a, a more compressed version of, of neural activity off the device. So it's, it's very similar to just the kinds of recordings that I was used to making in, in, in monkeys for you know, the last 25 years and working in the visual system. So, um, as I say, I, did, I, I never had very much input into the, al the decoding algorithm. Uh, I was very much, uh, in the early days, I was doing, you know, I like to think I'm very egalitarian. I was, I was building monkey rigs, and during the, during the pandemic, I was building, literally building the, the, the labs that we have in Fremont now. So. Um, I, was, I was very happy putting up shelves and, and putting out operating rooms and building monkey rigs, building eye trackers, you know, as well as, as every other part of the sort of academic side of it. So, so the, the, the transition, I think, wasn't really that tough because I never changed what I was doing, which was basically part builder, part electrophysiologist, part anatomist, and, and I just did things that I was good at. And, Thankfully, those were the things that were needed at the time. Uh, also, we also got into pigs, and um, there's a whole different story, but, but uh, I also got into like building pig sties, and like going to tractor, tractor supply company to buy fences and, and welding them up, and, and, and you know, I, I was, I, I, I'll do anything, basically. <laughs> so Thank you more, so much. Three more? Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, we're out of time, so let's just do a couple more. Hi, Dan. Hey. So, what sort of transformations does it take to encode image features into the visual cortex space? Like, I'm, I'm curious if you can speak on the language of neurons. Uh, they, I assume they don't take RGB and, um, you know, intensity. So, do they like frequency, amplitude, mm -hmm. some sort of funky serial? That's, that's precisely what we're investigating at the moment. And much of this work has, has already been done. Um, but basically, we when we stimulate the neurons, we're not able to, to choose what kind of percept we produce. The, the, what the person sees when we stimulate a certain population of neurons that just happen to be around that electrode, what the person sees is dependent on what those neurons do. So the visual system works like on a labeled line system. So you have a bunch of neurons that signal red. They only respond when something red crosses their, their receptive field. So if you stimulate those neurons, then you're going to see red. You can't change the, their selectivity. So um, the kind of parameters that, we, that we're changing are related to ways that we can change the, the uh, salience of that particular point. Uh, so far, we, we don't have electrodes in, in visual cortex of humans, but we do have it in, in some monkeys. So what we can do, it's very difficult to get a monkey to describe to you what they're perceiving, but what you can do is stimulate a flash and you can know whether they saw it or not because they're trained to look at it. So they're looking at a point in the middle of the screen. To begin with, you actually put real flashes on the screen and, and they get a reward with an eye tracker. You can tell when they look at the flash. You can give them a reward. But then you start intermingling those actual flashes on the screen with stimulating different electrodes and they look towards the region of their visual field that, that they see uh, uh, the phosphine. So the, num the percentage of the time is, or they look at that particular point gives you a psychometric measure of, of, of how salient that point is. Um, we don't know what precisely what they're seeing. That's really the next stage that we may do. The other, the other easier way is just to put this to the human and say, what do you see? So it, you could spend months trying to figure out what a monkey sees by trying all kinds of forced choice uh, you know, a match to sample tests in a human, you get it in seconds. Um, so that may be a waste of time and, and much better to just get everything proved uh, for insertion into humans and then go directly to humans. So, yeah, uh, the, things that we're, the kinds of things that we're changing are frequency. So we have little square wave pulses uh, that are sort of charge balanced, so we don't have any, any you know, electrical 
electrochemical imbalances. We can change frequency and change pulse width, change amplitude. Um, those are the main, the main things that we're, that we're playing with to, to plot psychometric curves in, in these models. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, ask questions. Um, I guess a lot of my questions come from uh, the difference between uh, private versus public uh, research. And, you know, there, there's one obvious question, which is, you know, uh, on the pragmatics, what's the difference in, like, for example, the timeline? Because, you know, there's always a runway, right? Whether it's a grant or a funder, you know, so, like, basically, what's the difference? What's the timeline that you're working on? What are your goals that you set? Um, and then the other question that comes from that is uh, basically like, uh, well, here's a good example. I think of, you know, we have all these small labs that are all working on analysis of electrophysiology data. And since none of us have the funding, we all kind of work together. And so we're so excited when Kilo Sort 4 comes out and there's the latest uh, spike sorting software. Do you guys like have the funding where you develop all of that in-house, or are you still very dependent on the uh, academic community for your uh, research and analysis? So I, I think we don't do as much research as most people think. We're, we're, we're not focused on research for research's sake, so everything that we do has to have a direct application. Um, we're not, you know, most of the research, and this has really been done already, uh, people have been working with motor control BCIs for, for 20 years, and, and the, the, the science has been done. We're developing the, the technology. Um, obviously, we're trying to refine the way that we use the science that's been developed and, and trying different things, but we're, we're not developing anything new. And that's true for the, for the motor BCI as well as for the visual system. Um, the objective of the company is to produce a medical device that can help people. It's not, to dis not yet, at least, to discover anything about the brain. Now, we're developing a tool which is actually going to be incredibly useful to scientists to discover new things about the brain, but that's not our focus. Uh, we're hoping, I personally am hoping at least, that we'll be able to give back this device to the scientific community um, and say, look, here's a device where you can record 6,000 neurons in a freely behaving monkey, which most neurophysiologists are just going to you know, wet themselves over. So, um, are you so, interested in giving it to scientists yet? Is that yes. Yet? We have not, well, we, we've collaborated with some scientists um, uh, from Stanford and also from UCL. I had a, 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 a poster at, at Society for Neuroscience on a collaboration. Um, th there are difficulties with putting this into the hands of scientists that are more difficult than, for example, the, the Utah array. So, the sort of, if anyone's not familiar with this, there's another brain interface that is pictured there, which is basically like a, uh, a device that puts electrodes into the brain. And this has been used for so far for many brain computer interface projects. And it's, they, it's also sold to scientists to use. We can't really sell our device. We'd like to, but the problem is that it comes with the robot implantation. And we're also not a service industry. We, we don't want to get calls from scientists saying, oh, my monkey's device stopped working. Can you send someone out to fix it? And so we don't have the, the, the infrastructure in place to support uh, the use of our device in academia. That doesn't mean that we don't want to be able to do that. And there are a number of models that we've looked at. One of them might be, for example, we throw a robot in a truck, drive up to a university, put it in the parking lot and say, OK, bring out your animals, uh, we'll implant them for you, and then we'll go again. Because uh, the robot is a substantial piece of equipment. Um, another one might be that we can somehow give or sell animals that are pre-implanted but there's a, there's a lot of issues around that that make it very difficult to do with the way that animal research is organized in universities by IACACs and by uh, the USDA and by licenses that you need to sell animals and to and even things like, you know, we don't want to be foyered by, by companies and if we deal with, so for example, all our medical records from UC Davis were, were uh, obtained from the Freedom of Information Act, and you've probably seen horror stories in the press about, about, uh, about that. So we don't want to do that again. So that makes everything difficult administratively and regulatory to do. That doesn't mean that we don't want to do that. Yeah. Let's do one more, and then I'm sorry. Thank you for coming and talking at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on the surgical implantation process. So 
how much are humans involved, how much are robots involved, and then this might be kind of a naive question, but how do you know precisely where to put these electrodes in, right. in the brain? Yeah. So the, the, the surgery is, so the first thing we do is we have an fMRI image of the brain of the actual subject when they're trying to move their hand. Obviously, they're paralyzed, so it doesn't move, but we can find a part of the brain that lights up with fMRI. And we produce a trajectory with an interoperative targeting system. Uh, we use a one called Brain Lab which basically allows the surgeon to point a pointer at the surface of the patient's head and see on a screen an MRI or a CT at that level with, with a trajectory already placed. So with that, the surgeon basically can draw a circle on the skull, literally with a pencil, and drill a hole. We, we developed a, a little oscillating circular saw so we can cut a perfectly round hole. And then underneath the skull is the dura. The surgeon removes a, a circle of dura uh, with a pair of scissors and exposes the brain. And if the targeting was correct and we recognize that piece of brain from the, from the MRI and we, we can see you know, where we need to put the electrodes. Um, so far, that's all done by, by the human surgeon. At this point, the robot takes over. So the robot has a, a number of imaging modalities, a uh, very high magnification camera. And so that images the surface of the brain. And then on the robot controller's screen, we see that image, and he can basically place targets. Uh, so for our first humans, we had 64 threads, each with 16 electrodes for our 10, 24 electrodes. And the, the, the operator literally just clicks on that image of the brain wherever we want to put a target. And those targets are determined from the surface vasculature. So there's blood vessels running over all over the surface of the brain, so we avoid those. We don't want to cause any bleeding. But we also know where about within that region we got the highest fMRI activity. So we try and, and place our electrodes in, the, in those regions. Um, we also can change the depth that those electrodes are inserted. So in motor cortex, for example, you know, the cortex is a layered structure. We want most of our electrodes to be in, in the motor cortex. We want to be those in layer five because it contains like the output neurons. Those are the ones closest to the muscle. So we, we record from those. They also have to be big so we get great signals. So we can change the depth according to uh, uh, how deep those are inserted to maximize the chances of getting those electrodes. But the placement is basically follows, so we open up a, a circle that's about 25 millimeters diameter. The placement is basically, I hate this expression, but it's like, it's like a carpet bomb, basically. You know, we, we can change the density in some regions that we think are more likely to carry good signals, but we also don't want to uh, ignore cortex that we've exposed. So we have a sort of dense region in one part and then a scattering of electrodes everywhere else. Um, and as time goes on, we'll learn more about where the, the best places are to put these electrodes. But for the, for the most part, motor cortex is not very precisely uh, uh, um, sort of spatiotopic. Uh, the, the, the neurons are mixed up pretty well in there. So um, you know, it, it's not one of the most critical decisions. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, there's one question which is online, which is, what is the next 10 to 15 year plan for you guys at Neuralink? Yeah. And what is that for the industry and how is it going to progress? So the, the plan is to produce a device that can help thousands of people. We have a target to uh, implant uh, 22,000 uh, people by 2030. Uh, so we're going to basically ramp up exponentially. And the only way to do that is to do things at scale. So we'll have Neuralink clinics that will each have eight operating rooms, for example, a single neurosurgeon. And we'll have people coming in and going out on the same day to get their implants. And we'll be implanting thousands of people a week. That, that's, the, that's the aim. And just a non-tech question from me. I don't understand science. I heard, oh, I heard robot and Bluetooth, so I'm figuring out how do you charge the device in your Yeah, head. the device is charged um, with a coil, just like your sonic air toothbrush. Uh, the, you hold this coil against the, against the head and it uh, charges up in about an hour. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much for joining. Appreciate your time. Wonderful. Um, just for uh, some housekeeping, we'll be back in about a month with other guest lecturers. I want to thank the City Foundation, C US, UCSC, Fast Engineering, for helping us with all of this. 
and uh, tell your friends we'll be back. Thank you very much. Yay. Thanks very much.